Well, good morning, Grace Life. Let's stand together. We want to begin this morning singing a song of thanksgiving. The psalmist says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise. And that's what we want to do this morning as we sing forever. God is faithful. Let's praise him. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us. setting sun from the rising to the setting sun his love endures forever by the grace of God we will carry on his love endures forever sing praise sing praise sing praise celebrate you. God, we thank you that forever you are faithful. There has not been one moment in all of time that you have not been faithful and good. You've always been true to who you are, and you always will be. And in the middle of such sea changes going on in our world and in our lives, we are anchored firmly through faith in Christ to you today, God. And we thank you that we can stand on the rock of Christ Jesus, no matter what. And we know that our 
security is in you. And so we're here today to celebrate Jesus and Holy Spirit. We ask that you would fill this place with your presence and overflow our hearts with your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' good name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, you may be seated. We want to welcome you today to Grace Life. Last night, we ended a week in worship with our church family. Today, we're starting a week in worship with our church family. It's really a privileged place where our lead team gets to sit, where we get to take one week out and bring one week in in the same way. So what a joy to get to start this week off with you today. We are thankful that you're here. We are having worship guides available again to you. If you're uncomfortable taking those, don't feel obligated to take those. But based upon what we're hearing now from uh, CDC and others, that's not as big a concern as it was. So if you have a worship guide today, uh, feel free to use that to take notes. Or you can use that tearaway tab today. If you're a guest with us today, and there are some guests, and we're glad you're here. If you would like for us to know that you are here, maybe you have some questions about Grace Life, you can use that tearaway tab to let us know who you are and how you'd prefer to be contacted. Or if anybody has a prayer need, you can write that on the green tab as well. And there's a box as you go out the door over here today. You can drop those in that box as well as your tithes and offerings if you physically brought those here with you today as well. We also want to say welcome to everybody that's watching us on live stream today. Maybe you're at home or Maybe you're at the lake or you're at the beach on this Father's Day weekend. Wherever you may be, we're thankful that you've taken some time out to come and to worship the Lord with us through our live stream. I want to say also a continued thank you to everybody for the excellent job you're doing of being safe on this campus. Uh, there are people in the room today. It's their first time back since we started all of this. And so we want to continue to be consistent through this whole time. I know it goes against our nature to not shake hands and to not hug and to not walk around and talk to everybody. But I just appreciate so much that you're coming in and you're taking your seat and you're being safe. It just shows the maturity in Christ that you're taking other people into consideration and not just yourself. So I praise the Lord for your hearts to do that. When you dismiss today out these doors, we do have a new fellowship hall out here. This gravel parking lot is our new fellowship hall. So that's where you can talk to one another and spend some time in fellowship. And you're not going to be in anybody's way out there. So feel free to use that space after the service today to hang out. Another great place to hang out with us is at Shadow Lake. We're there on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights, 3.30 until 8 o'clock. And Miss Hannah and Pastor Bryant and others, uh, we're playing down in the lower field with our children every Wednesday and Sunday, 6.30 to 7.15. So if you're ready for your children to get outside and to play with us, we love to play with them. 6.30 to 7.15 down in the lower field, lots of shade down there at that time of day. And uh, Wednesday, Sunday, that's when we'll be there. Tonight we'll be there from 3.30 till 8 o'clock. And so we'd love for you to come and play with us between 6.30 and 7.15, we'll kind of have an organized sort of deal. We are thankful to be here today, and in the last hour, there was a couple that was su supposed to have been in worship with us, but uh, they were not. Uh, that's because this past Friday, one of our dear church members, Mr. David Holcutt, suddenly went home to be with the Lord. And so, Miss Lynn, I, you're probably watching, and you're worshiping with us right now, and our hearts are with you, and we love you, and we're praying for you. Uh, Mr. David was driving to work, and... Uh, had a heart attack as he was driving, and the car went off the road. And uh, But through that heart attack, that's how the Lord brought him home to glory. And so while we grieve today, we are uh, excited for our brother because his view in worship today is far better than any earthly worshipers have a view today. So we praise the Lord for that. Amen. And I know you'll be faithful to hold Miss Lynn and that family up in the days to come as you always do. I'm so thankful for that. Let's stand. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. God, once again, we thank you for your faithfulness today. And we pray, especially today, for Miss Lynn and her family, for comfort. Other church family today that are facing trials and sorrows and challenges. God, we are grateful that you are faithful. And Lord, with the passing of our brother, God, it just reminds us that we are thankful today for our salvation. We're mindful that life is just a vapor. None of us have another moment that's promised to us. But as the redeemed, blood-bought people of God, we know that when our heart stops beating this side of glory, we'll be present with the Lord. Your word is clear. To be absent from this body is to be present with you. And we long for that day. And we're grateful this day 
for the hope that we have because we can say, God has saved my soul through the work of His Son, Jesus Christ. We rejoice in that today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you know the Lord has saved your soul today? Have you told all your family and all your friends? And when that day comes for me, you can cry for a minute, but just know, because he saved my soul, you'll know where I am. Amen? Amen. Let's worship the Lord. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You are my God and you saved my soul. I was lost when you came to me, came for me. You were held in chains, and then Jesus set us free. Let's sing. I was lost when you came for me, held in chains by the enemy. But you broke them in victory. Now I'm free. I am free. You're my joy, and you are my hope. I am saved. By your grace alone, I will sing of your love for me. I am free, I am free. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You are my God and you save my soul. Now I stand with the King of Kings. Now I stand with the King of Kings. He has paid for my every sin. And from now through eternity, I am free. I am free. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You are my God and you saved my soul. What once was dead is now alive. We praise Jesus. What once was dead is now alive. You gave to me the breath of life. You brought me up out from the grave. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. What once was dead is now alive. You gave to me the breath of life. You brought me up out from the grave. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You, my God. Praise the Lord this morning. We have assurance of our salvation in Jesus. We don't doubt that because it's not about what we do. It's about what he has done. Let's pray. Jesus, we, we thank you for what you have done on the cross. God, there's nothing so good that we can do that would bring us salvation. And there's no sin that we can commit that you won't offer us forgiveness if we repent of that sin. And, and so we praise you for that this morning. God, thank you for the assurance that we have of our standing before you because of Calvary, because of the cross. And my prayer this morning for us is that we would look to the cross, that we would stand in awe of, of what you have done to make us your own. In Jesus' name, amen. Sinner, come and see. Christ.
Christ the Lord upon a tree. See the crown of thorns adorn the king who labors to breathe in agony. Come, O sinner, come and see what our God became to set us free. Come, O sinner, come and mourn, for he calls your sin his own. Do you feel the weight of justice served? He suffers the wrath that you deserve. Come, O sinner, come and mourn, for he bears the curse for all you've done. Oh, the wonder of this awesome scene where our Savior bleeds. Oh, the power of the love of God come and stand in sinner come rejoice mercy fills this place of scorn for he dies to save his enemies that all who draw near may know his peace come O sinner come rejoice death of Christ, death is destroyed. Oh, the wonder of this awesome scene where our Savior bleeds. Oh, the power stand in all. And you guys can have a seat. And the act of baptism itself uh, tells the story of Jesus, that he came to earth and he lived a perfect, sinless life. He died in our place and was buried and then was raised from the dead. And so baptism portrays that, but it also portrays Mason's story as well, um, that he lived his life for about 11 years, but like all of us, was a sinner. We're all sinners, separated from God. Uh, but at 11 years old, he turned to Christ in faith, called out on Jesus to save him. And in that moment, uh, the, the old um, Mason was buried with Christ in his death, and he was raised into a new life. The Bible says, you know, in church, kids, a lot of times we say, you ask Jesus in your heart. And there's nothing wrong with saying that. Uh, but I think the more biblical way to describe it is that God actually gives you a new heart. The Bible says in Ezekiel, uh, we have a heart of stone, but then at salvation, he takes out the heart of stone. He gives us a heart of flesh. In other words, he, he causes us to be spiritually alive now. So... It's because of Mason's profession of faith in Jesus that he's coming today to publicly profess uh, his salvation that Christ has provided for him, right? right. 
Did I get all that right? Oh, yeah. All right, man, I'm excited. So, Mason, upon your profession of faith in Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, being buried with Christ in his death and raised to walk a new life. And the act of baptism itself uh, tells the story of Jesus. I'm here with my good friend, Miss Kenzie Gilliland. How you doing, Kenzie? Good. Good. We love Kenzie at Grace Life and her family. They're all precious to us. Uh, they're striving to point her to Jesus. They have her at Brook Lane Academy, a great Christian school in Hueytown. And it was while she was at school that she asked Jesus to come into her life. And we get to celebrate that today as Kenzie's following Jesus in baptism. So Kenzie, upon your profession of faith in Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, your dad is baptizing you, his sister in the Lord, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in his death and raised to walk in new life. Yeah. Amen. God's on the move. I think I told you we, we got to start showing two baptisms a week instead of one. Because so many people have been following the Lord in believers' baptism, and we praise the Lord for that. We are thankful that you're here. Man, I just love standing here, and you'll see me kind of looking around the room. I just like to see who all is here, and I'm, I'm thankful to see all your faces. Let's go and see the face of God today through His Word. Revelation chapter 8 is where we're going to be. We've been walking through the book of Revelation now. I think this is maybe week 8 or 9. I don't know. I've kind of lost count. But it's a good time to sort of back up and review a little bit, okay? The same John who's the earthly writer of this book called Revelation, is the same John who was one of Jesus' disciples. By the time God is giving him the book of Revelation, John is the, the last and final disciple that's still alive. He's living out his final season of life, it seems, on an island called Patmos. He's a prisoner there because he would not stop testifying about Jesus. And it's on Patmos where God reveals himself to John in what you and I now call the book of Revelation. The first three chapters of this book focus on Jesus communicating to his church, in particular, seven churches in, um, in the area of where modern-day Turkey is. But Jesus is speaking to his church as a whole. That includes me and you. And as he's talking to his church in Revelation uh, 2 and 3, he's affirming them. He's affirming that they have a future in him. He's applauding the things that he sees in them that is good. And he's also admonishing them for the things that he sees in their churches that are not good. And then we leave chapter 3, and John is taken in the Spirit to heaven in Revelation 4 and 5. Revelation 4 and 5 are two of my favorite chapters in the entire Bible. One commentator said they're the most glory-filled chapters in all of Scripture, and that may be true. And when we get to Revelation chapter 4, John sees heaven. He sees the throne room of God. He sees this myriad of angels gathered around that throne, and there is God the Father seated on the throne, and in his right hand, he's holding a scroll, which we understand is the title deed to all of creation. Ownership and the plan to restore and redeem all of creation is wrapped up in that scroll. And that scroll is sealed with how many seals? With those seven seals. Inside that scroll is the end of brokenness. Think about that. Inside that scroll is the end of sickness. Inside that scroll is the end of strife. Inside that scroll is the end of division. Inside that scroll is no more heart attacks, no more cancer, no more COVID, no more hate, no more death, no more Satan. Inside that scroll is new heaven and new earth. And heaven is crying out in Revelation 4 and 5 for somebody to break those seven seals, to open that scroll, and to bring all of that to pass. But nobody is found in all of heaven that is worthy to break those seals and to open that scroll. John sees that, and John says, I began to weep. He begins to cry like a baby until one of those elders that encircles the throne of God says to John, hey, you can stop your crying now. Look, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's worthy to break the seals and to open the scrolls. Then John turns, probably thinking he's about to lay eyes on a lion, but he doesn't. 
he turns and what he sees is a lamb. And this lamb looks like it's already been slaughtered, but it is clearly not dead because John says that lamb is standing. And then in a stunning moment, that lamb ascends to the throne of God the Father. God the Father extends his right hand with that scroll toward this lamb. And that lamb extends his hand out and receives that scroll from God the Father. You see, this is not just any old lamb. This is the lamb. The lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world by the shedding of his own blood for you and me at the cross. And Jesus takes that scroll from the hand of his Father. And this amazing worship scene breaks out in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And this is where we sing, is he worthy? Is he worthy? And what a beautiful day that was at Grace Life. And then we turned the page and we got to chapter 6 of Revelation. And chapter 6 now is where Jesus begins to break each of those seven seals one at a time. And in doing so, he begins to reclaim all of creation for his own. Seal number one, he broke. We called that bogus peace. Seal number two, brutal war. Seal number three, global famine. Seal number four, death. Seal number five, prayers for revenge. And seal number six, panic. And in the middle of all of the breaking of these seals, we got a glimpse into heaven of something else. John sees into heaven this altar and, and, and it seems to be an altar where, where prayer is the centerpiece of that altar. And beneath that altar, he sees souls. He sees the souls of men and women who during those seven years of tribulation, they turned in faith to be saved. They, they put their faith in Jesus. And consequently, many of them then were murdered because of their faith in Christ. And John sees those souls under the altar. And what are they doing under that altar, by the way? Do you remember? They're praying. Specifically, they're, they're praying for revenge. And not only that, but then John also sees, you may remember from last week, he then sees a multitude of people that he says nobody could count from every tongue and tribe and nation gathered around the throne of God. And one of the elders tells John, do you know who these people are? And John says, no, but I'm banking on the fact that you do. And he says, yes, John, I do know these are people who were saved during the tribulation. Their robes have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. So we get this beautiful view of of what's happening in heaven. So that, in a nutshell, if you've missed anything in Revelation so far over these eight weeks or so, that's kind of it, wrapped up in a nutshell for us today. Now, along the way through that journey, something happened to me. I kept bumping into a theme in the book of Revelation that I did not expect to bump into. In fact, the first time I bumped into this theme, it wasn't even in my study I remember very clearly that I bumped into this theme right in the middle of my preaching. It, it wasn't on my notes. It was almost like in that moment, that theme just kind of jumped off the page at me. And I realized something that I had not realized before. The theme that I'm talking about and that I want us to talk about a little bit more today is the theme of prayer. In all my time of reading and studying the book of Revelation, I've never seen the theme of prayer surface to the top quite like I've seen that surface to the top in these days. I remember that Sunday that I saw it. I was preaching out of Revelation 4 and 5, that glorious scene where the scroll is in the right hand of the Father and Jesus takes it from his hand. In fact, I'll take you back there just so you see the moment, the place in Scripture where it hit me. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, this is where it happened. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And it wasn't in my notes, but in that moment when I saw that these golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, it hit me and it hit me pretty hard in a good way. He hears our prayers he cherishes our prayers in fact it seems that he even collects our prayers there in the throne room of heaven and I think it hit me especially in that moment because there was a young lady I remember as I was reading that in that service and I'm not sure I think it was I think it was maybe the 9 30 maybe it was this hour there's four of these across the weekend now and I can't remember one from the other 
But I remember as I read that, I laid eyes on a young lady in the congregation that earlier that week, Pastor Saint and I had counseled with. And I knew that because what she was going through, like me, she needed to be reminded, yes, God hears your prayers. I know you're questioning whether or not he hears. I know you're questioning whether or not he cares. I know you're questioning whether or not your prayers ever get past the ceiling of the room that you're in. But he does. He is listening. And I'm pretty sure across those four services that weekend, it was only two services that heard me go off my notes and talk about that because it wasn't ever supposed to have been a part of the sermon. And then it happened last week again. This theme of prayer just jumps out again. This time, not while I was preaching, but through the study of getting ready for that. It happened in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. It says, when he opened the fifth seal, you may remember this from last week. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. And we talked about this. Apparently, this is not an altar where sacrifices are made for sin. There's no need for that anymore. Jesus is the final sacrifice. Apparently, this is an altar of prayer. And John sees these souls of men and women who lost their lives in the tribulation because of their faith in Christ. They're beneath this altar and they are praying. And specifically, they're praying for vengeance And God answers those prayers, right, when he breaks that sixth seal. We talked about that last week. So twice already in our journey through this book, our attention has been drawn to this altar. Twice already, at least, our attention has been drawn to these golden bowls and this incense, which we are told is the prayers of God's people. Now, when we stopped last week, six of those seven seals on that scroll were broken. Today we get to this climactic moment where Jesus breaks that seventh and final remaining seal on that scroll. And when he does this, don't miss this, when he breaks that seventh and final seal, four amazing things are going to happen. And we see them clearly in our text today. Here's the first one out of Revelation chapter 8. When he breaks that final seal, heaven is hushed. Heaven is hushed. Look at the text, Revelation 8, 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Did you get that, boys and girls, on your scavenger hunt? For 30 minutes, heaven became completely quiet. Every angelic creature, think of this, every angelic creature and every blood-bought, redeemed man and woman, boy and girl had watched as seal after seal after seal was broken on that scroll. With the breaking of each of those seals, the scroll was opened up a little bit more and a little bit more. When that final seal is broken, heaven held its breath, completely quiet. Until now, every time God's drawn our attention into heaven, around the throne of God, it has been loud. It has been rocking in praise and worship. Sounds of thunder and praise and hallelujahs. God likes it loud, I believe. But now, John says, for about 30 minutes, heaven is hushed. And here's why. Heaven knew that with the breaking of this seven seal, they knew, heaven knew what that meant. Heaven understood that when that seventh seal was broken, it meant the end of a world in rebellion against God. It meant that the end had come for this broken and fallen world. Heaven understood that with the breaking of this seventh seal, Jesus was about to be exalted as King of all kings and Lord of all lords. Heaven knew That with the breaking of this seventh seal, that sin and Satan were about to know the full weight of Jesus' heel upon their head. As he finally crushes them once and for all. And this reverent awe falls over heaven. And these creatures, these angels that had seen so much over so many years knew that they were about to see something like they had never, ever seen before. They knew they were about to see Jesus, the King of glory, mount his white stallion and ride into this world for his second coming 
as King of kings and Lord of lords. The power of God is about to be released on all creation. And heaven is silent. Heaven is silent because heaven realizes that Jesus is about to come back into this world to take this time by force what is rightfully his. And heaven stands in this stunned silence. And that stunned silence is only slightly interrupted when the second amazing thing happens. Number two is this. Angels are assembled. Angels are assembled. Verse 2 says, Then I saw seven angels who stand before God. In fact, it says, Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God. And seven trumpets were given to them. I didn't want to miss that definite article of the word the. Apparently, this is a very particular group of seven angels that have been stationed before the throne of God. Psalm 104 gives us the idea that when God created everything, He created these seven angels. And from that day to this day, they have been faithfully worshiping God before His throne. But on this day, on this moment, these angels are assembled. These seven angels are assembled together to do something that across all those years, they've never, ever done before. This is a new day, and this is a new moment for these seven. In this particular moment, these seven angels are each given a trumpet. That's, boys and girls, seven trumpets. I, I know you don't remember this. I had to think real hard for me to remember this. I started preaching a series back in January of this year. That was just six months ago, but it feels like a decade ago. I asked the last service, do y'all remember what, what series I was preaching back in January? It wasn't John. Good guess, because we spent two years there. We took a couple of months and we went through Joshua. We preached on 2020 vision. Now, if you had a vision for 2020 in January, you probably don't now. <laughs> but we had God's vision, and that's all that matters. We only follow His, not anybody else's. But you may remember from probably not my preaching, because that's been long forgotten over the course of everything that's happened in these six months. But from being a Bible student, you probably remember the first fortified city that the children of Israel got to when they crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land was the city of Jericho. Remember how they took that city, right? Seven days they marched around that city. Seventh day they marched around it seven times. And then with seven trumpets, the priest blew a blast and that signified this place is about to come under new ownership. Here we get to Revelation chapter 8. Here's seven more trumpets. Now these angels aren't going to sound them all simultaneously like they did at Jericho. They're going to get trumpet one and then some things are going to happen. Trumpet two and some things are going to happen. But with the sounding of these trumpets, the same message is sent. This place is about to come under new ownership now. So heaven hushed and the angels assembled. And then number three, prayers are offered. Here's our theme again. Prayers are offered. Look at verse three. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. All right, boys and girls, I am fresh out of golden censers. But I do have this. This is a, a communion cup, a Lord's Supper cup that I sometimes use in weddings. By the way, I, I love it when brides and grooms honor the Lord with the Lord's Supper in their wedding. I think that's pretty special. We use this sometimes for other special things. So he, here's what I'm saying, boys and girls. When we read about this golden censer, this angel takes a, a censer. It's kind of like a vessel, a container. This, this one that is in Revelation here is made of gold. might have been suspended off chains. You might have held it by some chains up in the air like that and walked with it. Verse 3 says, Another angel came and stood at the altar with the golden censer. I believe this is that altar of prayer again. I believe we're right back to where John had seen the souls of those men and women who were killed because of their faith in Christ in the tribulation. I believe that's where we are. And the Bible says this angel goes to this altar with his golden censer. And it says he was given much incense. Boys and girls, that's stuff that smells good. Heaven's fragrance went into that censer that this angel was carrying. He was given much incense to offer. And that wasn't the only thing that went in this censer. Along with the, what? Prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. So there's this altar of prayer before the throne of God. And in this day, on this moment, this angel has heaven's fragrance in that censer. And then he gathers up the prayers 
of all the saints. Here's a good place to remind you the word all here in the Greek means all, and that's all that all means. That means your prayers in this moment, every prayer you've ever prayed, I believe, every prayer I've ever prayed, I believe, in this moment, are scooped up off the altar of God, and they're placed in this golden censer along with the fragrance of heaven. Every bitter prayer, every painful prayer, every hopeful prayer that you've ever prayed in this moment, gathered up off this altar of prayer and put into this golden censer. Censor. And then this angel, with heaven's fragrance and the prayers of all the saints in this vessel, he then pours it out. After having mixed it all together, then he pours it out on the altar. Verse 4 says, And the smoke of the incense, with the prayers of the saints, rose before God from the hand of the angel. Don't miss this. God's ultimate purpose for the universe is about to burst onto the scene as a response to the prayers of God's people. What God is about to do now is a direct response to your prayers and to my prayers. God's purposes, I believe, are accelerated when God's people pray. Not only are His purposes accelerated when we pray, but I believe miracles are multiplied when God's people pray. And, and I began now to see something in this book of Revelation that I've never ever seen before. There is a direct connection between your prayers and my prayers and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Those are related. The second coming of Jesus Christ is in response to the prayers of all the saints, the prayers of God's people are the catalyst that God uses to bring this broken old world to an end. The prayers of God's saints is the catalyst that God uses to usher in a new heaven and a new earth. Listen, don't miss this. From Revelation chapter 8 to the end of the book, everything that begins to happen now seems to be in response to the prayers of the saints being offered up. From the altar into the very nostrils of God. God's ultimate plan for this world will come to pass because, for reasons I don't fully understand, God in His sovereignty has chosen to respond to the prayers of His people. How many times have you thought, I don't know if He's listening. How many times have you wondered, I don't know if he cares? How many times have you been in a situation and it seemed to you that the prayers just couldn't get beyond the ceiling of the room that you were in? You prayed for healing. You prayed that death wouldn't come to your spouse or your child or your grandparent, your friend. You prayed that there would be a good report. You prayed that there would be hope in the midst of the hardship. How many prayers have you prayed? And to this day, it seems that God did not answer. And He, and he has not answered. Yet. Yet. If you've ever wondered what has happened to all those prayers that I prayed, now you know. He's kept them, every last one of them, cherished them, treasured them, and has held on to them for such a time as this. The seventh seal is broken, and heaven's hushed. These angels are assembled, prayers are offered, and then as a result of those prayers being offered, number four, power is released power is released verse 5 says then the angel took the censer follow along kids it censer and in went the fragrance of heaven in went the prayers of all the saints mixed together poured out on the altar rose up as an aroma before God and then the angel comes back to the altar and now he fills up that empty censer with the fire of God vessel was emptied, 
so that it could be filled with the fire of God. When vessels, and you're a vessel today, when vessels are emptied on the altar of God, they can then and only then be filled with the fire of God. He's searching today for those who will worship in spirit and truth. He's searching today for those who will empty themselves of themselves so that they might be filled with the holy fire of God. You know what's wrong with our world? There's not enough saints walking around filled up with the holy fire of God. They got a little candle, but they're not filled with the holy fire of God because we love ourselves too much to empty ourselves on the altar of God. You'll never be filled with the fire of God until you're emptied out of yourself before God. The censer is emptied of our prayers and that smoke and that fragrance rise up to the nostrils of God. And then the angel fills that up with fire from the altar. And now with that fire from the altar of God, I want you to see what happens now. That power is released from heaven onto the earth. Look at verse 5. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar, and he threw it on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. When our prayers and the fragrance of heaven were poured out as an offering, and the fire of God filled that vessel and it was cast down onto the earth, it sets off a chain reaction of these seven angels blowing their trumpets. And let me just give you an overview of what that's going to be like. Revelation 8, 7 says, The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood, and these were thrown upon the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Verse 8, The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel blew his trumpet. What's going on? We're announcing a change of ownership. A great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. Verse 11, the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Chapter 9, verse 1, And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star falling from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and not find it. They'll long to die, but death will flee from them. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. That's 200 million. I heard their number, John said. Verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone. They could have repented. But after all this, they still didn't. Nor did they repent of their murders, their sorceries, or their sexual immorality, or their thefts. And we have to go all the way over to chapter 11, verse 15, to hear that seventh trumpet blast. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, don't miss this. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord. Change in ownership and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. 
And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. Anybody notice a phrase missing there? Is to come's not there. Every other time it's been who was and is and is to come. There is no is to come there. You know why? Because he is no longer coming. At this point, he has come and he has come to stay. There will be no coming again. This is his coming once and for all. So don't miss what's missing there. Who is and who was. For you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raised, but your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged. And for rewarding your servants, the prophets and the saints. And those who fear your name, both small and great. And for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Listen, I've heard people go through the book of Revelation and spend a month trying to figure out what wormwood is. Hey, listen, maybe that's... That's a big deal. But here's what the bigger deal is. Revelation chapter 8 is a call to pray. Revelation chapter 8 is calling the saints of God to have an enlarged view of why God has given us prayer through the life and death of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 8 is intended to remind us that we can boldly approach the throne of God in our time of need. Revelation 8 shows us that our prayers are used by God to usher in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this has blown my mind this week. To come to the realization that when I pray for some normal, mundane thing in my life, it is not normal to God. It is not mundane to God. But every prayer, every God-honoring prayer He keeps and He treasures and He holds on to and the prayers of God's people are going to result one day in this old broken sinful fallen world melting away and a new heaven and a new earth being ushered in not one God honoring prayer you've ever prayed has God not listened to not one God honoring prayer have you ever prayed has he not heard he's never forgotten not a single one those things that we prayed for that seems he didn't answer, he just hasn't answered yet. Because when he comes in all of his glory, every bad thing that's ever happened in this broken world will be made right. Everything. I want to close with two thoughts today. The first one is this. After seeing this this week, I walked away knowing this. We cannot pray enough. My vision of prayer just got enlarged in one week, more than it has been enlarged in all my life, put together. That these prayers that we pray in this moment stretch well beyond this moment. They stretch to the very throne room of God, and they usher in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot pray enough. This is why Jesus said, never stop praying and don't give up. Don't lose heart. Why would Jesus say that? Because he knows what your prayers do. He knows where they go. He knows what's going to happen. They're going to usher in his return to this world. So he says to us, don't stop. Don't stop praying. Don't give up when it gets hard and you're tired and you're weary. Keep on praying. Don't lose heart because when you pray, my purposes are accelerated in this world. The second thought that I want to leave you with is this. When the people of God unite in prayer. You can pray in your closet. You can pray in your car all by yourself. But don't miss this, saints. We could spend the rest of this year going through Scripture seeing this. There is something powerful, something dynamic, like no other. That happens when the people of God come together, uniting our hearts and our minds together in prayer. When we join together to pray. God's purposes accelerate. Miracles are multiplied. I believe that with all of my heart. And listen to this. I know 2020 has been a hard year. On so many different levels for so many different reasons. None of us can even remember January for crying out loud. Because of so many things we've gone through and experienced. 2020 has been taxing and exhausting and 
tiring for so many reasons. And, and all the dangers, toils, and snares that we have gone through in 2020, do you know the one thing that Grace Life, through all of that, has not gathered together to do? For six months, we've not gathered together just to pray. Now, half of that time, we're scratching our heads trying to figure out if and how we can gather together. We've not gathered together to just pray. And that changes tonight. Tonight, I'm calling you to join with me and my family at Shadow Lake. From 7.30 to 8 o'clock, we're going to be silent for half an hour, just as heaven soon will be silent for half an hour. We're going to be silent in that half hour as we watch the sun set. We're going to spend the final moments of daylight on Father's Day with our Heavenly Father. We're going to encircle the lake. Tonight, I hope tonight we will get as close as we possibly can get to the entire church family and any other brothers and sisters in Christ that want to join with us. I hope we'll get as close as we've been to a full gathering of our church family since March that we've been. You need to come a little bit early. Bring a chair if you want to sit somewhere. Kneel, stand. I've asked our staff and their families and our deacons and their families to join me in the corner of the lake by the pier. We're going to spread out. We'll be socially distanced, and I won't lead. There's no sound system big enough to handle that. We are just going to stand, sit, kneel, bow for 30 minutes before the Lord. We are in very unique days, to say the least. They're hard days. They're heartbreaking days. They're challenging days. They're days that are all too often filled with anxiety, uncertainty, and fear. They're loud days. It's loud outside of us. It's loud inside of us in these days. But tonight for 30 minutes, we're going to get quiet. And we're going to be still. And we're going to know that He is God. And maybe, just maybe, we'll pour ourselves out in prayer before Him. Maybe, just maybe, He'll fill us up with His fire. Because what this world needs is to see the fire of a holy God burning in the hearts of His saints. Would you stand and let's pray? Our Father who is in heaven, there is no other name like your name. Your name alone is holy. We pray that your kingdom would come. And we pray that your will would be done. On this broken earth as it's done in your perfect heaven would you meet every physical need today and would you forgive us our sin as we forgive those who've sinned against us father don't let us be led into temptation deliver us from evil the kingdom's yours, the power's yours, the glory is all yours.
breathe life into these dry and thirsty souls. Lord, hear our prayer. Forgive our sin. As we call on your name, would you make this a place for your glory to dwell? Let that fire fall, Lord. Open the blind eyes, unlock the deaf ears, come to your people as we draw near. Hear us from heaven, touch our generation, we are your people, crying out in desperation. Lord, hear our cry. Come heal our land. Breathe life. Breathe life into these dry and thirsty souls. Doesn't that describe us this morning, dry and thirsty souls? Jesus, we need you. Lord, hear our song. Your children worship. As we sing out your praise, would you make this a place for your glory to dwell? Make this our prayer. Sing it out. Open the blind eyes. Unlock the deaf ears, come to your people as we draw near. Hear us from heaven, touch our generation. We are your people, crying out in desperation. from heaven hear us from heaven hear us from heaven he does hear us from heaven yes, he does. hear us from heaven he always does hear us from heaven hear us from heaven our generation we are your people crying out in desperation open the blind eyes unlock the deaf ears come to your people as we draw near hear us from heaven touch our generation Crying out in desperation. And I only have a minute. I don't even have that. We got another service coming right in. We got to get the room set and be sanitized and all that good stuff. So listen quick. 
I hope you'll join with us tonight. If you're able, I hope you'll be there. I'll I, I tell you what I'll do. If, if you're not, there's a, there's a little bit of a rise. You've got to walk up to get up to the lakeside from that lower field down there. All right? If you're concerned you can't do that, I'll do my best to have the old gate where we've always come in. I'll do my best to make sure we get it open by 7 o'clock. Might not be before 7, but by 7 that way, you got a little easier way to get to the lakeside. Now, if I can't make that happen, or if we run out of space, it's limited down there, all right? Just bear with us. Uh, but I hope you'll be there. In these days, it's been hard to keep our hearts and minds united together as a church family. We're bombarded by so many things and so many different places and sources. And because we're physically not able to connect and unite like we're used to, that's really magnified that challenge. And so for the next several weeks, as you leave service, we're going to be giving you a booklet. This is week one. It'll be a different booklet next week. It's some resources that we're recycling into this. Uh, but it's, there's seven days of devotions in here, really simple. But I want to challenge you to think of doing it like this. I got this bad habit of when I wake up, I grab my phone to see what, what happened in the world overnight. Not, right? I mean, you just don't know day to day. But instead of opening up my phone tomorrow morning searching for a crisis, I need to open up Scripture and search for Christ. So let's start our day with this devotion together tomorrow. Just add it to whatever you're already doing. But what, with us all doing this together, we'll know, even though I don't see a lot of the people in my church family, we're seeking the Lord together. Literally, we're going to be on the same page. Pull it out again in the middle of the day sometime. And maybe call a family member, a friend, a co-worker, somebody in your Sunday school class, D group, small group, and say, hey, let's take 10 minutes and just walk through this together. I think that'd be good for us. And then at night, do that again with your family. Do it before you go to bed. Saturate yourself with this all day long. Let's all do that as a church family. Because of our situation, we got to work extra hard to keep our hearts united together as a church family before the Lord. There's no end in sight to this. Just know that. At Grace Life, and it's not even because of COVID. we got a school campus on this campus now. There, we will not experience the old normal on this campus again. You need to go ahead and just know that. It's not going to happen. We're going to move, and there's going to be a new time over that new campus, but the way it was here is never going to be like that again. All right? I don't say that to depress you or to rock your boat. That's just reality. There's nothing we can do about it. This is not our home anymore. We don't own this place anymore. We're in a time of transition. So that means we got to do more in our walk with the Lord, we got to do more in our walk with each other to overcome some of the obstacles that are in our path. And those aren't obstacles, those are opportunities. Amen? Amen. Now i got to get you out of here. All right, so we're going to dismiss this side over here first. I know I'm sounding in a hurry, but don't be in a hurry. Keep space, all right? As soon as y'all are piling out, they're coming in and sanitizing everything. I love y'all. Tonight we're playing with kids, 630, 715, 730, we're praying. We're praying, all right? Let's do it. Grace Life, love y'all.